Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on an introduction to poetry. So in this mini lecture we're going to kind of play around with and talk about poetry and understand some of its underpinnings, understand you know its relevance in American literature and those things. So away we go. So some things you should know about poetry or understand about poetry in order to better value it. And I'll say from my own experience, I'm not a big poetry fan, right? I don't find myself yearning to sit down and read a book of poetry or even read a single poem or two. Um, it's not necessarily my forte, and for many people it's not their forte. That being said, there's a lot of interesting and powerful things that are done with poetry. <clears throat> And it's useful for us to look at and understand how poetry works, why it works, and the ways in which it's relevant to American literature. Poetry is a, is a great tool for creating and capturing voice, and that's something we are looking towards in this course on literature. So we, all have to, we first have to understand that even though it's not popular today, poetry used to be quite popular uh, in, the, in, in previous centuries. It's less popular today. I think, <clears throat> I think my, I, I would guess that it's less popular today because of the fact that we nowadays have accessible music. Uh, 200 years ago, if you wanted to use, if you wanted to hear music, you had to be exposed to some kind of musical instrument. Today, if we want to hear music, we have a lot of devices to hear music. But so, what was something that could help, that that could be melodic and enjoyable to the ear? Well, poetry was memorizing, reciting poems. This was something that was done a lot, in part because it was the closest thing to music besides singing. And we have to understand that, f particularly within American literature, you know, there is an attempt with poetry as the voice of the people or the voice for the people. That is, there's a, there's a, there's a big tie with poetry and the people. And by the people, I mean masses of people. Uh, we'll talk about how Walt Whitman really tries to capture the voice of the people. Uh, but there is certainly a lot of connection between the popularity of, of poetry, it being a, a medium, or I shouldn't say a medium, but it's a, a genre that was largely for people uh, of all different backgrounds and trying to capture, um, capture that and capture the world around it. We have to understand that the power of poetry is, is often not in the reading of it. Poetry... Uh, at least for, for much of its history, was not meant to be read, you know, sitting down in a chair by yourself in your own head. But there is performance that goes hand in hand with poetry. And this goes all the way back to the ancient epics um, that, you know, reading poetry has been a tradition long held in cultures throughout the world. But in this case, you know, when we think about poetry, it, especially the poems we read in this class, they're not just there to be read, they're there to be spoken. In fact, poetry is considered part of the spoken word tradition. And to really enjoy a poem, you have to read it aloud, and you have to hear it aloud. Reading it on the paper doesn't work, uh, or it can work, but it's a very limited way of listening or of enjoying poetry. In order to understand it, in order to appreciate it, you need to read it on the paper, but read it aloud and listen to it and really hear everything within that poem. Because a lot of poems are focused on sound and how they sound and what they're projecting with sound. So you do want to pay attention to that. And I'll tell you, in my own experience, I'm not, as I said, I'm not a fan of poetry, but I find I appreciate, understand, and can, and can get to the gist of a poem much better when I read it aloud or when I listen to it aloud while reading the words. And that's one of the big things is that poetry is centered on patterns of sound, right? You may have heard of iambic pentameter, which is a very popular metered sound for epic poetry, for um, Shakespeare, right? It's a pattern of sound that is 
is well known, but there are lots of different ways you can pattern sound. And when we talk about patterns of sound, we can mean, you know, a strong and then a soft sound, a soft and a strong sound, sounds, you know, soft, soft, hard, 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 soft. You can mix around the, the intensity of the sound, you can mix around how words are stretched out, all of those things, but it's around patterns of sound and that the poem's content is important, but so too is how that content sounds to the listener. We also have to recognize that there is an author of of every poem, but that author isn't always the speaker of the poem. Right? So be aware of that just like with fiction, right? You have the author of the story, but then you might have a character telling the story, right? When we read The Black Cat, nobody assumes that the I in that story is Edgar Allan Poe. Well, we have to also remember that, the, that there may be a fictional speaker telling us this poem, that it is not necessarily the author telling us this poem. And it's sometimes hard to tell, and we, we have to be careful about making that assumption or that leap. We also want to be aware of lines, verses, grammar, punctuation. We want to pay attention to how the author has created the poem and structured it. That structure gives us hints, gives us ideas. You know, they're often playing with it for effect. And we generally don't want to read to the line. We want to read to the sentence if we're going to make sense of things. We want to understand the sentence in full and then go back and look at how and why the author broke that sentence up into lines. We want to be aware of how punctuation changes our pattern of speaking as well as punctuation. As I said, you want to read sentences, not lines, but you do want to go back and, and once you've read the sentence, understand why the line, why the sentence was broken up into those particular lines. And really what we want to understand is the expression of the poem. We want to get to what, it, how is this poem trying to move or capture me? And what is it using to do that? How is the poem reaching out to me and communicating to me? We want to get to how the poem moves the audience. So let's talk about a couple of uh, actual qualities of poetry and, and what we should be looking out for and be thinking about. So qualities of poetry, personification. We see this in fiction, of course, but it's, it's a very well-used device within poetry wherein something is something that's non-human is given human entities so they're given the power to speak or the power they're contrasted or in, empowered with human characteristics that we generally don't as associate with them we have simile and this is when we make a direct comparison between two ar between two things and we use as or like uh, the idea is to contrast, is to say, well, you know, life is like a box of chocolates, to quote Forrest Gump. Uh, we're making a direct co comparison between the two and saying, this is like this. Now, similes are different from metaphors, because in metaphors, we don't directly say A is like B. What we do is we say A is B, right? So, life is a box of chocolates. And when one of the reasons this can be done is for effect, um, saying something is like as opposed to saying something is focuses your attention and immediately begs, well, how is life a box of chocolates? And you therefore go into it. Um, but we want to understand metaphor is often seen as a, as a more powerful attempt um, to make a contrast, whereas a simile might be used to better frame, to, to connect um, ideas that you may not have been aware of. We have rhyming that takes place, of course. Not all poems rhyme, but some do. And again, rhyming is part of that sound, uh, that, that attempt at orality and hearing, that attempt at trying to, you know, appeal to the hearing senses. And we also know that rhyming is a good device for memorization, so it makes sense why poems have rhymed, because it's easier to remember and therefore repeat. We have onomatopoeia, so we're getting into certain sound qualities of poems. Um, onomatopoeia is when a sound it sounds exactly what it's supposed to, so bang is onomatopoeia, and it, it means something that's gone bang, that's made a noise. Um, you know, hiss, 
right? When we talk about something hissing, hissing is onomatopoeia. That's what it sounds like, hiss, right? When a snake hisses. Um, so th we want to be aware of how the author, the, how the poet is shaping our aural landscape and what kind of onomatopoeia, what kind of rhyming is being used. We want to be aware of repetition. Repetition is important for poetry. Um, first of all, it, it kind of creates a certain stability. Second of all, the repetition is useful for remembering. If you've ever looked at the Bible or some old text, you'll recognize there's a rep repetitive pattern that goes on, right? So in the Bible you hear, and then God did this, and God did this, and God, did, you know, you'll you'll hear this, and then, and then, and then, and that's a that's a purposeful repetition, de repetitive, uh, repet repetitive device in which it allows for people to better memorize and to better fit into the pattern and, and follow through with line after line. We also have assonance, and assonance is the repetition of a vowel sound. People are aware of alliteration, and that's what we'll talk about in a moment, but not people aren't necessarily as familiar with assonance, and that's the, the repetition of vowel sounds. So I do have an example here from Edgar Allan Poe. So listen to how this sounds. Hear the mellow wedding bells. Can you hear that? Hear the mellow wedding bells. That repetition of that E sound throughout. Right? You have those particularly mellow wedding bells. So assonance is, is a very useful tool and it's a very subtle tool that you're not always aware of particularly in contrast to alliteration. And alliteration you may be familiar with, you know, Sally sells seashells by the seashore, right? It's the repetition of consonants, whereas assonance is the repetition of vowels. And both are used, again, to kind of, uh, to make a poem sound or orally more engaging or to grab our attention or to put us in certain moods, right? That hear the mellow wedding bells. There's a, there's a, there's a soothingness to that sound, right? The repetition of the E is a very soothing sound versus, you know, cat kick the can, right? That the consonants and the alliteration is, is a very different feeling and vibe. So when we look at Emily Dickinson and Walter, uh, Walter, Walt Whitman, we're going to have to deal with free verse poetry. And much of poetry up until the, the 1800s is set up in some kind of traditional format. You know, you have a variety of, you know, some people are familiar with things like limericks and haikus, uh, sonnets, and each of those have a particular standard or have particular rules. And with free verse poetry, we get into this idea of there are no rules. That's that's how free free verse poetry has been pitched. I don't think that's entirely true. If we're talking about free verse poetry, what's happening in free verse free verse poetry is that the authors are no longer aspiring to a particular type of poetic format, but they're saying the rules and the laws guiding this poem are embedded in the poem. They're not found elsewhere. They're not created elsewhere. They're created by the poem and wherein the poem feels the rules need to be. So some people don't see that as a significant difference from just being able to write whatever you want, but I think a lot of poets that do end up writing free verse, they are creating rules, but they're rules that are guided and limited to that poem alone, um, and, and are subject to that poem alone. And so one of the major people that do this, is, of course, is Walt Whitman, and of course we'll also look at Emily Dickinson, but these are the you know two of the major people that start to change our understanding of poetry and, and move into this idea of free verse. All right, so what else do we need to know? As you get into poems and you start reading them, here are some things you want to be asking, you want to think about, and you want to jot down your ideas. It's really important when we come to poetry that, you, you know, they may, poems may be small, but that doesn't mean they're easy. And so you want to make sure you spend a good amount of time with each poem. 
And as you read it and after you read it, these are the questions you want to be thinking about. What is the tone and atmosphere of the poem? And how do you come to that conclusion? What tells you that a poem is dark and demeaning, or, you know, dark and, and horrible and, and, and tragic? Uh, what tells you that the the poem is happy and go lucky? Are you sure that's what's going on? Or is the author being ironic? Is the author trying to, you know, make something horrible seem good or vice versa? What kind of rhyme does the poem contain? Hard to tell? Read it aloud. Or, I'm sorry, what kind of rhythm does the poem contain? If it's hard to tell, you should be reading it aloud. I would say regardless, you should be reading it aloud. You want to hear the rhythm of the words. Because uh, there will be time and again rhythm within the words. And that doesn't mean it's rhyming, but that there is some pattern of orality present in the poem. What is the poem trying to communicate, and what phrases or elements of that poem tell you that? Right? So you're trying to think of what is the gist of the poem, but how can I prove that with what's in the poem? You can't just say, oh, this poem is about death, but then not be able to speak to specific things that invoke death or symbolize death. How does the title, if there is one, relate to the poem? You know, some poems have titles, and they give you lots of insight as to what it is. Uh, Thanatopsis will be one of them that we read by William Cullen Bryan. However, all, uh, almost all of Emily Dickinson's poems are without titles. So, how do we make sense of them? Titles can give us a really good understanding of what the work is about. What are definite symbols within the poem? What might be symbols within the poem? Uh, why do, what do these symbols represent? So again, we're playing with symbolism. We're trying to understand what's behind the symbols that are present, what's behind these ideas. How do we, how do we find a symbol and hold on to it and prove that it's the symbol we're talking about? And then where have you seen the ideas present in this poem in other readings from this course? How can you connect what you see in this poetry to anything that we've covered this far? We've waited until now to tackle poetry. It is, it is among the literary uh, genres we're looking at probably the hardest for us to, to deal with, <coughs> which is why we're doing it. We've saved it to last. We've kind of built up our skills to this point. So now is the time to look at these poems and say, hmm, how does this connect with that? I've been doing this all semester. I should be able to, you know, make these connections at this point. All right, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for listening and see you in the next lecture.